for praying for this revival and thank you for being here. And I'm going to ask our advances if they would just stand for a minute and just get a good look at these folks. <laughs> Brother and sister, yeah. Dan Parker. <laughs> What a joy it is to be here again at Snyder Lighthouse Church to worship the Lord with you and to give God glory. Thank you for coming. And I want you to do me a favor. I need you to come back tonight. Okay. We start at 6 o'clock mm -hmm. tonight, and I need you to come. Okay. Whatever's going on tonight in town's not going to be as important as what we're going to be doing here. And uh, you've prayed for revival. And you've asked God to send revival. How are we going to have one if we don't come? Yeah. And, you know, I've often said, how do we expect the lost to get excited about church or think about going to church when we won't go? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. So I need you here. Look, we need you to come. And I, I, I just pray that you'll show up tonight, fill the building up. If you got a habit of staying at home, just break the habit. Show up tonight. Come on. And worship the Lord with us. Amen. Amen. We love your pastors and thank the Lord for them. They're such dear friends that we hold very dear. Pray for them and uh, pray that the Lord blesses them and um, throughout the year. We're just so thrilled about these children up here and all that they have accomplished. It was so comical. Sharon elbowed me when, the, when this little girl got that big stuffed animal. She just grinned from ear to ear. And then when they went to give him boys, you got to get tools. <laughs> Go to work. <laughs> Reminded me of Father. Mother's Day, everything blows up. Everybody does it big. Father's Day, here's your socks, Dad. Okay. Here's your tie. Yeah. Y'all know what I mean? That's just, those boys, they, they just tickle me so much. So good to see all of this. I'm proud of all of these young people. Well, time's going to get away from me, and you're going to start twisting in a little bit. So we're going to go from laughter and fun and rejoicing to extreme urgency. The most urgent thing I could preach about, I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I never will forget that uh, on Sunday night at First Assembly of Van Buren, Arkansas, where Sharon and I have uh, been members for 35 years probably, <coughs> Brother Johnson, our pastor, stood in the pulpit on Sunday night and said, if I knew this was the last sermon I was going to preach on earth, I'd preach this. And he preached on being right with God Woo! and getting saved. And people got saved that night. And Monday morning, Brother Johnson went home to be with the Lord. Since we've been with you guys, uh, we've lost a grandbaby. Uh, we've lost other family members that were dear to us. Uh, you all know some of the trials that have, the enemy's thrown our way from being robbed and shot at and losing six family members in a row and then a grandbaby. Uh, so many things the enemy has thrown. And uh, this, this week we had a pastor friend that we preached meeting for in Texas County, had a great revival. He and his wife and some of their grandchildren were in the, his pickup truck and they were coming down the ramp uh, going to Highway 82 on the Texas side of Texas County. And uh, just before they got to the end of the ramp, he had a massive heart attack, lost control of the truck, flipped it over. His wife was severely injured, grandchildren injured, just had his memorial service, building a, a big, nice church, church that continues to grow, almost finished. Didn't like with just a few weeks maybe being finished, and he's in eternity. 
uh, yesterday. Uh, I went on Facebook and was checking some of my messages, and one of my pastor friends in California wrote and said, uh, an evangelist friend of ours that we had fellowship with when we were there in revival uh, and had come to the meetings and went out to eat with us had died suddenly and uh, at four o'clock yesterday morning. And the statement, if you're listening to what was said a few minutes ago, Rebecca used that line, if you make it. You remember what, remember what she said that? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. He will say, if you make it. And so, I want to ask you today, do you know, are you absolutely sure that you are ready to go? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that everything's right between you and him and your brother? Because it can't be right with him if it's not right with you and your brother. Oh, man. That's it. If you stand praying, forgive if you have ought against any, for if you do not forgive uh, your neighbor or your brother or your sister uh, here, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive you of your sins. Yeah. That's in red in your Bible. Yeah. And so the fact of the matter is there are a lot of people today who really thought they were going to heaven when they died and they ended up in hell. Yeah. That's a tragic thought and it's a scary thought that people actually, that said, it'd be a terrible thing to go to hell. It'd be a terrible thing to go to hell from Russia. It'd be a terrible thing to go to hell from China. It'd be a terrible thing to go to hell from Chicago. But to go to hell from Texas. No. To go to hell from Snyder, Texas. To go to hell from Lighthouse Assembly of God Church. Yeah. Come on. To have claimed this was your home church and to be right with God and then to slip into eternity and miss heaven. I'm telling you folks, hell is filled with people that had good intentions but did not get right. Yeah. They, they, they thought they were right, but they were not right. And I'm not their judge, and you're not. God is. I'm so glad it's that way. But I want to talk to you real quick this morning on that thought. Open your Bible to the book of Matthew. And uh, let's look at the um, seventh chapter, Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. I don't know if there's any way that this front set of fans could be turned down just a little. Sister Parker's just about froze over there, and she she just gets cool, and I'm like Frosty the Snowman. I can take it. <laughs> this cool weather agrees with me. It's not even bothering Sid so bad. He didn't even bring his his winter hat. It ain't cold enough, it ain't cold enough yet. Matthew 7, verse 21, when you have it, say amen. Amen. Have you noticed how small they've been printing these Bibles lately? Yeah. <laughs> Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So I'm going to talk to you for just a few minutes on the thought, Christians who ended up in hell. What a joy to be here today, Lord, and I ask you for the breath of heaven to breathe upon us. Let the anointing of the Holy Ghost sweep across this audience. I, I pray the spirit of conviction to grip every heart in this building today. Lord, talk to us about ourselves. Help us to get our eyes off of our brother or our sister or some issue that's going on in our lives and help us to think for the moment and to remember and 
to search our hearts. Are we really ready to stand before God? In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the saints all said, Amen. When we read these verses of Holy Writ, they do not describe the lost, the unbeliever, or the sinner. They describe people who have known the Lord and have walked with Him at one time. They called Him Lord, and they thought they were okay. And at one time they were, but they lost their way. Somewhere, somehow, some way, they lost their relationship with the Lord. They got caught up in their own web and became deceived into believing a lie about their eternal souls. We can become so self-righteous, ladies and gentlemen, sitting in church week after week. We can be filled with hypocrisy that we don't see clearly anymore. And we can believe everything that we were taught since we were a child that, uh, and be deceived by believing everything that Uncle John taught you. Do good things and you'll go to heaven. Listen, folks, good people don't go to heaven. Saved people go to heaven. The only way inside the gates is through Jesus. The eternal security of the believer. If you'll just once ever pray, you're forever ready. But listen, ladies and gentlemen, your Bible is filled with the teaching of backsliding and losing your way with God. You can apostatize and lose your way with the Lord. We say we love the Lord, but we hate our brother across the aisle from us. The Bible Bible teaches us we must live godly lives and be sober and be vigilant and forsake our sins, 1 Peter 5, 8. And you can read Proverbs 28, 13, Romans 8, 13, Galatians 5, 16, and 1 John 3 and 3. All of those deal with us individually looking at our own selves and living the kind of life that pleases and honors the Lord. Over the last couple of years, I prayed the prayer, Lord, help me and forgive me of everything everything that's offensive yes. to you. Yes. Yes. We're so afraid in this politically correct generation to offend anybody. When we had just this week in our churches, I've seen the video, I've seen the pictures of the people standing on platforms in our churches around the nation dressed in skeleton costumes and in witch costumes and, all, and zombie costumes and singing the songs of the Lord and so Celebrating the Lord dressed that way. You know, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I don't see it that way. I, I just think that, I think that people ought to celebrate the Lord and they ought to glorify the Lord and give God praise and glory. And, uh, and so as a consequence, I think what we do and how we act affects other people. And so I pray, Lord, forgive me for the things that offend you. I don't want to offend you. We do everything to not offend somebody else. You got to be careful. Don't say that. And we offend the Holy Ghost week after week. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 15 said, I know thy works. And ladies and gentlemen, he knows yours and he knows mine. He knows everything about us. And he said, because you're neither cold nor hot but lukewarm, I will spew or vomit you out of my mouth. And you read verse 19, he said, repent. He wasn't talking to sinners, ladies and gentlemen. He was talking to the church of Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. Now let me go over that again so you understand. It's in red in your Bible. In Revelation 3, 15, Jesus said to that church, I know thy works because thou art neither cold or hot, but lukewarm. I will spew thee out of my mouth. Verse 19 said, repent. He's talking to church folks that were not right with God. And listen folks, if God, Jesus saw that in a first century church, what does he see in this century in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? In Psalm 55, 51, verse 5, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. I read it in several other different versions. I was guilty of sin from birth, a sinner the moment my mother conceived me. Folks, with every sin, we walk closer to the precipice of hellfire itself. Yes. Every day we live, we are one day closer to burning in hell. And the only way not to go there 
is to be born again through the shed blood of Jesus Christ that poured down Calvary's cross. The only way you can be dunked in water till every tadpole in the lake knows your name. You can have your name on the church roster of every church in town. You can be a member of every secret society and order in town. But let me tell you, when you die, the most important thing you've got to know is your name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Are you ready to go? It's not what you did and how the, all the good things you did. It's what Jesus did for you. Amen. Amen. You don't get to heaven because of your good stuff. You get to heaven because of what Jesus did for you. Matthew Henry said in uh, uh, set of chapter 7 and verse 21 of the text, he said, Christ here shows that it will not be enough to own him for our master only in word or tongue. It is necessary that we believe in Christ, that we repent of sin, that we live a holy life, and that we love one another. He said, let us take heed of resting in outward privileges and doings, lest we deceive ourselves and perish eternally as multitudes do with a lie in their right hand. Let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from all sin. And I believe what the man said, ladies and gentlemen, we must live in a relationship with the Lord to get inside heaven's gates. You know, you wouldn't walk up to a stranger who lived up on Knob Hill and, and you wouldn't walk up to him at his gate and say to him, let me move in with you. I'd like to live with you from now on. Because you know what? He would refuse you entrance because he didn't know who you are. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And folks, Jesus said, he said, I will profess, depart from me. I don't know you. In verse 22, Jesus said, many, say that with me, many, many, many not a few, but many who believed in me and called me Lord. He said they didn't just believe in him, but they called him Lord will not be allowed into heaven. And these are not just any type of Christians when we read these verses, folks. These were spirit-filled Pentecostal people because Jesus described them in verse 22. He said, they will say to me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Where is any prophesying going on? Is it going on down at the Catholic Church or the Church of Christ Church? Don't get mad at me. Where is it going on? Most of the time, if it goes on, if you can find a church that will allow it to happen, it's in a Pentecostal church. He said this, have we not cast out devils in thy name? Well, how many churches got devils cast out? Yeah. It's in a Pentecostal church. And in thy name have done many wonderful works. That's in a Pentecostal church. That's the work of the miracles. I read Adam Clark's commentary and he said about verse 22, many will say to me in that very day, the day of judgment, have we not prophesied, publicly preached in thy name, acknowledging thee to be the only Savior and proclaiming thee as such to others, cast out demons who had taken possession of the bodies of men, done many miracles, being assisted with supernatural agency to invert even the course of nature and thus prove the truth of the doctrines we preached. These are Pentecostal people. These are people that had the power of God and they ended up in hell. Everybody that goes to hell is going to remember. The Bible said in Luke 16, 25, son, remember. And everybody that goes to hell is going to remember how they got there. Uh, you ask somebody, uh, you know, did you do that? No, I didn't do it. Somebody else did that. That's my mom and daddy's fault because they gave me a whipping when I was a boy. Yeah. Somebody help me now. Yeah. Everybody's going to know what took them to hell. There's lying, stealing, hatred, jealousy, gossip drunkenness. All oh, those are a byproduct of unbelief and not following the Lord's word and being saved. People go to hell over unforgiveness, refusing to forgive. Adultery, for fornication, bitterness. You'd be surprised at the people that sit in our churches week after week that are filled with bitterness and anger towards people. People with attitudes, brother. Pentecostal people have attitudes. 
Sharon and I preach regularly in churches where they have people, and I don't even know why they have me come to their church and preach, because I stand up and preach against it, and then we've got people in the church out there greeting folks and working in positions in the church who have friends with benefits. And that means they have other people connected in their lives, other men or other women or both. And they're married, but it's okay for you to get together and tramp around as long as this is a stipulation. As long as you don't kiss on the lips. What? Now, how foolish anybody with enough brains to keep their ears pushed apart ought to know that's downright stupidity. Yeah. Right? Yes. Just don't kiss me. And these are people that are supposed to be spirit-filled people, talking in tongues. You know, the largest homosexual church in the state of Texas is in Dallas. And their pastor, their own, they have their own broadcast. Their pastor in there, they're about 1,800, 2,000 people. And everybody that's there that attends that church, uh, they feel cool. It's okay to be openly gay, and they bring their partners with them. And the pastor said that God wants you to be saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. And he speaks in other tongues from the pulpit. But that's not the Holy Ghost. That's another tongue. You heard what I said. He speaks in other tongues. That's a demonic tongue is what that is. But see, this world is convinced that that lifestyle is okay. But that lifestyle, according to your Bible, it's not what you think. It's not what I think. It's not what the TV says. It's what this Bible says. And you've got to believe what God says. See, I know what's wrong with us. We stood straight until it got in our face family. And then when he went to working in our family, and we found out our niece, or our nephew, or our grandson, or our granddaughter, or our daughter, or son, yeah. lost their desire for their husband or their wife, and went and found somebody from the same sex to be with. And let me tell you something, all of a sudden people change their attitudes. Well, you know, God, loved, just like a lot of these TV preachers, you've seen their interviews. Well, you know, I couldn't say they wouldn't go to heaven. One famous guy from Houston says, you've seen the interviews. I watched one famous preacher from Dallas who's on, I called his name, you'd know him. And uh, the man asked him, said, so you believe that there are other ways to heaven? You actually believe that, uh, that uh, people from, uh, that, that Islamic people can go to heaven? You actually believe that uh, people who believe other doctrines like uh, other religions can go? He said, well, Jesus said, I have sheep from other pastures that you know not of. And that means them. Listen, folks, that's a lie from the pits of hell. The only way that you and I can get into heaven. St. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but, oh, I'm in Snyder, Texas. There nobody believes that. You'd be surprised at the, what people believe in our churches. And I'm not talking about the church downtown. I'm talking about Lighthouse Church. Yes. Amen. He said, Jesus said in Revelation 21, 8, but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The greatest prayer meeting ever is going on in hell. It's not in the Pentecostal church. There in Luke 16, 27, the Bible said he prayed. And everybody, I know there's no doubt people in hell pray. They want to get a chance out, but you don't get out once you go. It's forever. Yeah. Their torment and torture and pain is unrelenting and horrific. You know, a simple lie. But there is no simple lie. There are no white lies. There are no half-truths. It's a lie. And a simple lie sent a couple to hell with the apostle Peter as their pastor. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Acts chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. Ananias and Sapphira died for lying to God. Peter said, you haven't lied to me. You've lied to God. You know, folks, it's an, 
fearful thing to think that the odds are right here in this crowd, there's somebody that's going to go to hell. Somebody listening to me right here this morning, the odds are there's somebody here that's going to go to hell. Jesus said so in the text. Listen, Jesus said so in Matthew 17, verse 13 and 14. Enter you in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. And he said, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus said it clear. Many will say, Lord, Lord, we've prophesied in your name. We've cast out devils. We've done many wonderful works. And he's going to say, I, I don't know you. And they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. Listen to me, friend. Look this way. Nothing is worth losing your soul over. I don't care what you think of that girl. I don't care how enamored you are with him. I don't care how great you think he is. Everybody needs to know that your soul is worth more than anything. I just, like, I just can't let that drug go. I just can't forgive that person for what they said to me. Listen, they're never going to come to you and apologize anyway. You've got to forgive them anyhow. Let it go. Yes. Yes. Dr. Maurice Rawlings is from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Let me tell you about Dr. Rawlings and his ex this experience as I prepare to close. He was a war hero. We're about to, what is, is it this, this week, uh, Veterans Day? Dr. Maurice Rawlings was a scientist serving at, as medical director for Adventist and ZLB Bio Laborator Science Laboratories. He served as physician to President Dwight David Eisenhower. World War II Generals George Marshall, Omar Bradley, and George Patton. He was their personal physician. He was an associate clinical professor of medicine for the University of Tennessee, where I'm from. He, he was a national teaching faculty for the American Heart Association, and he also was a self-professed atheist. He did not believe in God until this particular day. He had an unusual experience with a patient who had come to him as a cardiologist and said, I'm having some chest pains and I don't know what's going on and I'd like for you to check me out. And so he ordered a stress test for the man and he put him on a treadmill in his office. And as the man started on the treadmill, Dr. Rawlings said, and I quote, the patient immediately went into cardiac arrest and dropped dead at the treadmill. He said, rather than fibrillating or twitching without a beat, his heart just completely stopped. And he said again, I quote, his body began to go through a series of scattered muscle twitches and convulsions and he started to turn blue immediately right there on the treadmill. They picked him up, placed him on a gurney and went to work on him. And Dr. Rawlins said that the nurses assisted in trying to help revive this man. And he said as they went to work doing compressions and getting him hooked up to all these different things to try to get him ready to go to the hospital, Dr. Rawlings shared this alarming story. He said, as we were doing chest pains, he said, this man started to come to. And Dr. Rawlings reached for an instrument. And as he reached for the instrument, he said, the man faded back out into unconsciousness. And he said his eyes rolled back. He said his back arched up real high. He said he went into great convulsion and he stopped breathing and he died again, went flatline. Dr. Rawlings said, each time I regained a heartbeat and would reach for that instrument that I needed, respiration came back to him. He said, as soon as he would, was able to start to breathe and could speak, he said he screamed, I'm in hell! Dr. Rollins said the man was totally terrified and pleaded with me, help me! Dr. Rollins said I was scared to death. And he said I watched this man as he pleaded with me, please don't stop, please don't stop, I'm in hell! 
Dr. Rollins said again, and I quote, I noticed a genuinely alarmed look on this man's face. He had a terrified look worse than the expression seen in death. He had a grotesque grimace expressing sheer horror upon his face. His pupils were dilated. He was trembling and perspiring profusely. His hair was standing straight up on end. He said every time he looked at Dr. Rollins and said every time you stop I go back to hell. Don't let me go to hell. Dr. Rollins said he was in a panic like I'd never seen a man before. He said he, ex he experienced four episodes of complete unconsciousness and clinical death from cessation of heartbeat and breathing. He screamed at me, how do I stay out of hell? And Dr. Rollins, he asked Dr. Rollins if he'd pray for him as he screamed, please help me. Dr. Rollins recalled a prayer he had heard as a boy, and he told him, well, repeat these words. Lord Jesus, I ask you to help me and keep me out of hell. Forgive me, and I'll live for you. He said that's all he could remember about it. And he said the man started screaming out to God, please forgive me. Lord, I'm sorry. Please give me another chance. Don't let me go to hell. Dr. Rollins said again, I quote, I had always dealt with death as a routine occurrence in my medical practice, regarding it as extinction with no need for remorse or apprehension. Now he was conceived, convinced of the reality of the Bible and its teaching on hell. And he got saved. Now listen, ladies and gentlemen, the man survived. And from that day, Dr. Rollins said when he'd come back for his checkups, he'd be talking to him about the Bible and what he was learning about the Holy Word of God. Because he saw hell itself. And he said, I'll never let my life get into a place where I could go to hell. You know, folks, Jesus said hypocrites are going to go to hell where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, Matthew 24, 51. In Luke 16, verse 19 through 31, there was a rich man uh, who was clothed with purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. We all know those. And verse 23, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. Verse 31, if they will not hear Dan Parker preach, they will not believe or be persuaded though one rose from the dead and went and told them. He said if they won't believe Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. If they won't believe them, they won't believe if somebody rose from the dead and told them. You know, life is filled with choices, folks. And everybody in this building or where you're at today, you're whatever you did today, you got yourself to church because it was a choice. You came by choice. Somebody may have had to twist your arm a little bit, but you came. And listen, ladies and gentlemen, you don't have enough good in you to get inside heaven. That's the ultimate pride to think you're good enough that God's not going to send you to hell. You cannot be good enough. The only way you or anybody, including me, can ever set our feet upon the streets of gold is to be born again and know Jesus as our Savior. It's His royal red blood that cleanses you from yourself. It's not the good stuff you do. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Could the, Sister Connie, could you come to the piano, please? Hallelujah. Some time ago, well, about, a, about two years ago, uh, you know, it's been this past June was a year when Dad left us. And... Uh, I'd been come in from some revivals and stopped by mom and dad's to visit and, and we ate dinner with them and, and dad had made a big pot of chili. Chili sounds good about this time of the year, don't it? And uh, he said, son, you want to go with me? I said, where are we going? He said, we're going to go talk to this man. He called his name and, uh, and he said, I'm going to bring him this chili. And I said, okay. We went down there and I, I, he said, now, son, this man, you know him. He runs a local motor, a lawnmower repair shop. I said, oh, yeah. He said, you know, I've been working on this man for years. And I didn't even know a thing about it. 
It blessed my soul to know that dad was reaching, not just going to church, not just sitting like so many of us do. They got the lights on, heat on, air on, place is trimmed outside, looks neat, clean, floors vacuumed, bathrooms are presentable. We're good to go. But you know what? There's an eternity bound population outside these doors and everybody you know in Snyder is either going to heaven or going to hell. And so he had been working on this man for three or four or five years trying to get him saved. And boy, he used gutter language. You dad take his lawnmower down there or weed eat or something. And boy, he just using God's name in vain. And, and I'd done the same thing, took mine down there, and he just, oh, I just, oh, man, you don't need to talk that way. Oh, I know how you Christians are. Well, we kept going. But I, I went with, with Dad and brought the chili. And, what are you bringing that to me for? What are you up to? He said, well, I care about you. And he said, the most important thing is, Jesus cares about you. Yeah. He said, you mean you cooked this for me and my wife? Yes, I did. I want y'all to know Jesus. And he said, well, I'll take that chili. I don't know about Jesus. He took it in. Well, three or four months later, I was by there, and Dad had made up a big old pot of beans. Come on, son. I said, where are we going? He said, we're going back to see that old boy at the lawnmower shop. And I said, okay. We're going to talk to him about Jesus. Let's go. And we go and talk to him about the Lord. Well, I don't know why y'all keep coming down here because I don't want to hear that religious stuff. Dad said, this ain't religious stuff. This is about Jesus. Yeah. This is about him. Amen. We don't want you to be religious. We want you to know Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And so... I'll take him beans. And then on and on and on this went on. All those four, five, six years, whatever it was. And on this day I went down there with him. And we pulled up and Dad had picked some of the stuff out of his garden and brought. And the man was sitting out in his truck, just sitting there. Looked like he was asleep. I walked up to the door of his truck and I said, hey man, called him by his name. He looked at me and said, hey, here he goes. The preacher's coming to... Call me to repentance. And I talked to him. I said, look, man, Dad's got some stuff out of the garden for you. I just don't get it. What is it with you people? And Dad said, we really care about you. Because one of these days, you're going to die. And when you die, you're either going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell. And nobody should go to hell. Amen. He said, y'all really believe that, don't you? And I said, I most certainly do. I look in the faces of people every week where I preach, and when I look in their faces, I wonder if I'm going to meet them in heaven or they're going to miss heaven and go to hell, and I never see them again. Yes. Because none of us know when the very last service we're going to be in, including me. Right? Yes. And so he said... Just out of the clear blue, he reached out and took that bag. And he always had a beer. He always had a big chaw in his mouth. He said, excuse me. He put his beer can down in his deal in his console. He said, back up, preacher. And I backed up. And he Poo! cleared his mouth. I think I want to pray. Praise God. And he reached that hand out to me. Soaking wet. And I looked at that hand and flashed through my mind like lightning. That's the hand of some mother's boy. That's the hand of some dad's son who have long been gone. And this old man's reaching it out. We got to throw the lifeline out to him. He's got to be saved. He's never wanted to pray. And we took him by the hand. 
And I said, Dad, because Dad was the one who led him. I said, you do the praying. Dad let, started leading that man to Jesus. And this old hard-hearted, stiff-necked, reprobate, so bound in chains of darkness with the heart as black as the hinges on the gates of hell, with all that in his mouth and the beer sitting here and a gutter-filled mouth became a born-again child of God with his name written down in the Lamb's book of life. I'm telling you, he was gloriously saved. He didn't get it in a church. He got it at his pickup truck. And he really got saved. Yeah. Tears was running down that man's face. Dad was crying. Dad was an old, old army sergeant, tough as shoe leather, but Dad cried with him. Hallelujah. Yeah. He's meeting Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory. And the next time we saw him, he was about dead. He just had cancer come on him, and in three months, he was about gone. Let's go see him. We went down there to see him. How you doing, man? Well, the doctor said, I'm filled up with cancer. I don't guess I'm going to be here long. And Dad said, well, you still living for Jesus? Oh, yeah. He said, I'm not going to be here long, but I'm going to heaven. And he said, one day... I'm going to meet you two old Parker boys. Oh, my dad is standing there. He throwed both hands up. Woo! Glory to God. Hallelujah. Yes. Because that's what it's all about. Yes. Your eternal soul is worth more than that little spot of land you got. Yes. It's more than all that you're trying to get. It's more than that herd of cattle, that herd of horses you got. Yes. It's more than that wad of money you got at the bank. Oh, it's yeah. worth more than everything. Yes. Worth more than the whole world your soul is. Yes. And today, you know, it was about two weeks later that old guy died. And Dad called and said, son, that old boy, he died. I said, he did. Dad went to his funeral. He told me later, he said, son, it's the saddest thing. Wasn't but about 12 people there. Nobody to celebrate him, but I did. I walked up and looked at that old beat up, worn out, broken body laying in that casket. And I could remember him cussing and talking filthy and half drunk. He said, he ain't that way. He said, boy, that was a smile on his face. Old boy died, ready to go to heaven, live for God. The remaining time he had on this planet. It. And uh, when they went out to the funeral, that's the funeral, I mean the cemetery. I just can't go home. They ain't going to even be anybody down there with his wife and two or three family members. So he went down there and they said, his wife said, I know you. You're the one that brought that food. He said, yeah. And he said she cried tears, fell across his casket saying, you're the one that led my husband to Jesus. And Dad just said, I couldn't help it again. I cried, said, I was blessed to be able to talk to your husband about Jesus. Now that old reprobate got saved because the blood of Jesus cleanses the vilest sinner clean. Whoever you are and whatever kind of rottenness is in your heart right now, Jesus died to save you and cleanse you from it. Amen. And now... He's been gone for about four or five years, and now Dad's gone. You know, I don't know if it works that way or not, brother, but I just kind of had the feeling that old rascal might have been at the door waiting, at the gate waiting when Dad came through. Maybe he was. If, he got, if there is such a thing as being notified, I, I just kind of got a feeling he might have been standing there waiting when Dad came through. Yeah. There he is right there. Come on in here with, with all of us into the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. I've tried to be the best friend I could be to you, the best friend you ever had in your life by having you face the truth about you. Are you ready to meet God? You know, we lost a little grandbaby, and I can't tell you the tears I've cried. I can't tell you the brokenness that I felt and my sweet wife look at her and just start crying. What's wrong, honey? I'm thinking about Samuel. His name was Samuel Albert Parker. Well, I had a great uh, uncle named Albert. My granddaddy's first name was Albert. My daddy's first name was Albert. My middle name, my name is Daniel Albert Parker. And Joseph and Kylie chose to name him Samuel Albert Parker. 
I think about it, I'm never going to get to take that little guy fishing. I'm never going to get to take him hunting. I'm never going to get to take him out and show him how to trap. I'm never going to be able to take him out and show him grow a beard out with me every hunting season. Come on, somebody. <laughs> My, my two boys, John and my son-in-law, this year doing this. We're going to get pictures around Christmas together if the Lord tarries is coming. But every day I think about Samuel and what he's doing and where he's at. Well, I, I believe Dad's looking out for him. Dad's with him and our family members are there. We know the Lord is there and looking out for him. But let me tell you something, folks. You can't miss heaven. Because heaven's filled with wonderful, sweet, loving, caring human beings. People that you thought you couldn't live your life without. And somehow, some way, you've been able to keep going. Yeah. Because you don't look at the event of their death. You look at all that you had while they's living. Yeah. You look at all the good stuff you had. And you know that God's, look at all the stuff God's helped you to get you through to this place. Yeah. Stand with me all over the building. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Oh, God of heaven. I plead the blood of Jesus, and I pray the mercies of God upon this audience of people. Lord, don't let anybody leave here unprepared. Don't let anybody leave not knowing that they're really ready or not. God of heaven, oh Lord, help us to see ourselves like you do. Pull away the plastic and the fake and the phony and all the stuff we put up to hide ourselves and help us, oh Lord, to see what's really going on in our hearts. And if there's anything that's not right with you, help us to make it right with God on this very first service of revival. Lord, in the name of Jesus, give us the courage and the boldness to step out. In the name of Jesus. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I'm not going to take you through any kind of a spiritual calisthenic. Raise your hand, put it down, all that. I'm going to ask you today, in the name of Jesus, to be a man. I'm going to ask you to be a woman. I'm going to ask you to have courage on Sunday morning. If you are unsure, if there's a doubt in your mind, if you know that there are some things that you're involved in that the Lord is not pleased with. And if he calls you today, if he calls you in the next five minutes, you really wouldn't be ready to meet him. I'm going to ask you in the name of the Lord to not gamble another day